Thank you all for coming today. This is the second annual uh, Commercial Fisherman of Santa Barbara uh, Fisheries Workshop. And first I'd like to introduce Greg Gorga from the Maritime Museum. He's executive director here. And they've graciously given this auditorium, donated this auditorium for us to use today. Welcome. Thank you for uh, choosing us for the venue. Of course, uh, Maritime Museum takes a very wide uh, view of maritime history uh, and of such a rich history in this area. And certainly commercial fishermen are a big part of that history and we uh, try to celebrate that as well. I want to invite you to uh, two uh, events we have coming up. Uh, this Thursday, April, uh, November 10th at 7 o'clock, Don Barthamus, the former head of the Marine Tech Diving Center at City College, will be doing a talk on the history of diving in Santa Barbara, and certainly abalone uh, diving had a big part of our, our uh, long and rich history in, in commercial diving, and made, uh, besides uh, with the oil industry, Santa Barbara the mecca for commercial diving and the leader in diving technology. So that's a, a 7 o'clock this Thursday. It's free to our members, $5 for uh, non-members. And then a week from that, uh, Friday, November 18th, from 5.30 to 7.30, we're having an opening reception uh, open free to the public for the our newest exhibit, which is the Prisma Diving Bell. Hopefully you saw that big orange bright bell on our patio. World's first commercial lockout diving bell, allowing diving to uh, exit underwater, work on an oil well, come back into, and start decompressing on the way up. Uh, it was first launched right in front of the museum on the Navy Pier and first built here by Dan Wilson. And so it's a very big event for us and for the diving community. Uh, so we hope you can join us for that. And I. Uh, would be remiss, especially since I have a board member here in the audience. Uh, we are not uh, governmentally funded. We depend on donations of uh, our, our public and, and membership. So if you're not a member of the museum, I encourage you to become a member. Uh, it's very inexpensive and there's membership cards in that kiosk outside our front doors as you're leaving. Uh, feel free to grab one and also there's flyers on all of our upcoming events. All right, thank you very much. So the Maritime Museum is not our only uh, <coughs> supporter of our organization. We also have a few other bigger ones. We've got a lot of supporters in the community, but um, Highliner Studios, uh, is a, he's a Scott Walker in the back. He's videoing this, this workshop for us today, and it will be posted on the CFSB website. For those of you who've gotten email notifications about today's event, then you should be getting a, not a notification for uh, when that's posted on our website. If you, are, if you are not on our list, you can go to the CFSB website and, uh, and sign up to our, on our membership list and you'll just get haphazard emails from me once in a while. Uh, also, um, the Santa Barbara Fish Market is a very good supporter, obviously for most, uh, all of us fishermen here in the room and uh, for our community. Um, just a little bit of uh, describing the format of today's workshop. We will have, uh, I'll make a, an introduction to each of our presenters. We have uh, just a, roughly, we have Ed Bacchus from EcoTrust. We have Joe Sullivan from, um, I'm sorry. We have uh, Joe Sullivan from Mutt McGregor Law Firm. And we have uh, Elizabeth Bridgewater from the Community Development Partnership. And she gave, and she has recently partnered with the Cape Cod Fisheries Trust in uh, Massachusetts. So this, the goals and the purpose of this workshop today is informational only. It's to get other people's stories of their experiences with uh, alternative management strategies that are going around in, um, that are occurring in other parts of the country um, predominantly on the East Coast and in some of our federal fisheries. So I'd first like to properly introduce Ed Bacchus. He's the Vice President of Fisheries at EcoTrust. He lives in Newport, Oregon. He oversees the Marine and Copper River programs in Alaska. And he's a, he is a founder and chair of the North Pacific Fisheries Trust, a community fisheries quota revolving loan fund, an eco, which is an EcoTrust subsidiary. He has worked on community economic development teams with Enterprise Cascadia, an EcoTrust founded organization. He is past chair of the board at the Prince William Sound Science Center in Alaska, a board member of the Alaska Sustainable Fisheries Trust, and a, conservative committee, a conservation committee member of the Sea Change Investment Fund. Ed received his Master's of, of Forestry Science from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and a Bachelor of Science 
in Wildlife Biology from the University of Vermont School of Natural Resources. He was born and raised in marine science family in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, and fished commercially out of Nantucket in the early 1980s. Space button. Mm -hmm. Cool. <clears throat> well, thanks for having me, Stephanie, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can talk about this topic, and so Stephanie and I talked about it a little bit, and she's probably thinking I'm going to approach it from 30 degrees, and I'm probably going to come at it from 75 degrees. So uh, we can, I, I think, um, also there's an overlap between what I'm going to say and what Joe and Elizabeth are going to say, and so hopefully we'll get through it in expedited fashion so that we can really get into the Q&A, because that's, I think, where the rich part of this is. So um, I, I've worked on cat shares issues for about 10 years from the community development perspective. Um, I'm not a cat shares advocate per se, and as you'll see, we've worked on a lot of the serious effects on communities and, and uh, community-based fisheries for, for some time. Um, I like this painting. It's f from Alaska, a painter in Alaska who goes to council meetings and tries to find the humor in the process. And uh, um, you, know, you can see the smart guys running the stock assessment models and, <laughs> and the big guys are yelling and uh, medium-sized companies are going, whoa, I got to get out of the way, and uh, the brokers on his cell phone trying to do some deals in the background, and, and, uh, and the halibut on the table is going, wow, how many pieces am I going to get cut up into? And of course, if you look in here, the sort of you know, National Marine Fishery Service guy looks kind of caveman-like, and so <laughs> anyway, um, but it's all about the design, and I'm going to try to talk about it from a certain perspective of effects that we've noticed, and Joe will agree or reinforce or disagree with me, and Elizabeth will back up or take a different angle on some of the finance issues I'm going to talk about. Um, so, um, but let's start out with a, with a problem statement, um, and, and Joe can talk about this as well, but over 15 years or longer in Alaska and British Columbia, you basically see when you uh, have a quota share program or in New England now they're calling it uh, allowable or annual catch entitlements, you can see those migrate away from communities when you have market-based transactions. So when you're in a market system, you can get the, the asset of fishing can go away from a particular community and go to another community or go somewhere else altogether. Um, you develop barriers or to new entrants, intergenerational <coughs> transfer uh, in a community, um, getting new people into that uh, fishery in that community, it creates um, some serious problems. High debt loads is one of the big ones. Um, you want to figure out a way to support individual businesses and individual ownerships and not have everything necessarily go into community or different alternative structures. You want to secure long-term access because you're trying to, in the midst of natural variability and other economic issues in the, in the variability you know, category, you're trying to establish relative stability. And most of all, in our view, you're trying to retain the connection between people and place. So let me start with a story, and this is an actual newspaper story that was published maybe seven or eight years ago in the Juneau Empire, which is the main newspaper in the capital city in southeast Alaska, the state capital of Alaska. A young guy, 26-year-old, he's got 15 years of deck experience already working with his father. He wants to become an owner and a captain. He's based in Petersburg, Alaska, arguably one of the most successful fishing communities in southeast Alaska. He's going to have to lay down half a million dollars for a sane boat, gear, and all that, just for salmon. It's not even an IFQ program. He'd like to get into halibut quota, but it's 28 or $32 a pound now in southeast. Um, you've got dock price fluctuations, and he's looking at, I think the newspaper story said he could go to Harvard Medical School twice for the amount of money he's going to have to lay down and eventually pay back to, to get into a halibut quota-based fishery. Uh, 
And so the question becomes partly, what drives IQ prices and, and how do we deal with this? But I'm going to try to talk a little bit about these broader set of issues. So community stability, viability, this intergenerational equity, the effects of leasing, creating high debt loads, and what do we, what, what do, we do about that? Can we create alternative structures that help us deal with these issues and at the same time uh, keep individual ownership alive and the incentives around that? Um, and we can come back to a lot of this in the discussion. But in Alaska, you get initial issuees or any quota program, you get initial issuances. Basically, it's an asset for free. And in Alaska, that, there's a lot of leasing going on also in British Columbia. Lease rates can be 45 to 50 percent of, of uh, the, the revenues, even higher in some cases. Um, you get uh, retired initial issuee owners um, leasing quota, which generates a lot of, of cash. But that also makes the lessers, who are the guys on the vessels, start with way less revenues at the gross revenue level when they hit the dock. But that cash Buys, can buy a lot more uh, quota for those initial owners. Um, some fisheries have caps, cap levels in the, in the amount of quota. A certain individual or entity can own, some don't. Um, uh, in Alaska, um, there are very few uh, owners that are capped in their holdings. So um, those buyers, since there's a lot of cash in the system, uh, they can afford to pay higher prices for quota share because their initial cost basis is effectively zero. Um, they've seen in BC that leasing shuts down periodic trading. The point, if you're going to have a quota system, the point of it is that you would have a fluid, uh, um, liquid market. Um, but with leasing, essentially, you're um, freezing the ownership. And so you're losing, if there are benefits to a quota market, you're leasing, you're losing those benefits uh, if you're doing leasing. Um, and I'll move on, but perpetual leasing uh, leads to this sort of sharecropping effect where people who, guys who are on the water or fishermen who are on the water never have a chance to, to actually get a hold of the quota because somebody is going to lease it in perpetuity. Uh, and the way that some of the new ground fish uh, setups on the Pacific Coast here, you can sort of lease beyond the grave. In other words, you're es you could set up a family trust or an estate, and that estate could, that trust can continue to lease um, when you're gone. Well, we can talk about this more. Um, gifting, uh, so I own quota, and I'm going to give it to my son when I retire, and, uh, but I'm going to take some revenue from my son for my retirement process. Um, and he's going to have a lower cost basis than some guy who's never been in the system. And so that's why you see, um, uh, that's one, that's one, I think one of the drivers that, that, uh, drives a sort of escalating, um, uh, quota prices, at least in Alaska. Um, the price earnings ratio, the price you pay for something and how long it takes to earn it back is at least 25% better for the giftee compared to the new entrant who comes in from the side and says, hey, I want to get into fishing. Um, I apologize if this is uh, overly detailed for the start, but um, we, can, we can come back to it. But you all know about debt, of course, and this is just a very uh, simple example, but 25,000 pounds of halibut um, generates a huge amount of, uh, of debt if you are coming in as a, as a non-gifted uh, new buyer. Um, I won't really dwell on this, but uh, it's uh, 750,000 is a lot of uh, a lot of money, and 225,000 is a sum that a lot of us, most of us, don't have in our pocket uh, as a cash down payment on a on a federal fisheries finance loan. Um, so, what are some of the things that we've looked at to try to um, deal with some of these things. Um, sector programs in New England that Joe can talk about, community fisheries associations, people have begun to experiment with, community trusts, community quota entities, which is a, is a program in Alaska that's not functioning that well. There's also community development quota corporations, which I'll get to in a second. But 
basically, we're sort of explore, we are exploring with various community fleets, developing new capacities, new governance structures at the community level that leads to effectively co-management, um, but recognizing the tension between the individual business and collaborative approaches, but trying to design it so that one supports the other. In the Alaska Sustainable Fisheries Trust that I'm involved in Alaska, we still have this sort of dynamic tension about we'd like to hold quota at the community level in trust for in perpetuity for residents only, new entrants, but there's still that tension of uh, are, the per, are the members of the fleet who are promoting that idea, they're in a minority and it still feels like to a lot of people that's treading on individual rights of ownership. Whereas uh, if you look at some of the rules of the game with community quota entities, um, it's only for new entrants and after five years, um, you have to cycle out of the program, you're trying to bootstrap your own ownership. Now this all assumes, of course, that you have quota programs in place. Um, Joe and I got invited to uh, a communities workshop in January that Noah put on. You can see the range of issues here um, that we discussed and there wasn't necessarily concurrence on all this, but um, we've got to figure out how, if we're going to get catch share programs, how we're going to help communities adapt to them and what are the pathways for doing that. Um, Ecotrust organized, well, I have copies of both proceedings of these things, then have the NOAA report and it's online if you're interested in, and in Ecotrust in 2010, 2011, we put together a national panel on the community dimensions of catch shares to try to get other voices besides ours saying, look, uh, there are community provisions written into the Magnuson-Stevens Act. Um, the councils and NOAA are playing ping pong about who's really supposed to write the guidelines for these things. Let's kind of uh, get on with dealing with it. So the national panel said, look, um, NOAA should really uh, support these, uh, these pathways for supporting fishing communities um, and these community initiatives. They should, it becomes a, a question of may or must. Should we require the development of community fishing associations when we're gonna have a catch share program? And should we really um, put some budgetary resources into defining these guidelines or are we just gonna let communities uh, figure it out for themselves? Um, and my experience to date indicates that communities are really going to lead the way. And so uh, the Pacific Council deferred on defining community fishing associations and how they could operate. Um, they didn't say they couldn't happen, but they're not really providing much of a framework. And on the other hand, NOAA is not doing that either. So in fact, what you see is a plethora of community type organizations, permit banks in New England, community fishing associations, community quota banks, community quota entities in Alaska, they have all these different names. Sectors, fishing cooperatives, marketing associations, um, and examples like in Morro Bay that Joe can talk about, the San Francisco Community Fishing Association, the Alaska Sustainable Fisheries Trust, the Cape Cod Fisheries Trust, Cape Barnabas Community Quota Entity, which is one of the few functioning ones in Alaska, the Maine Permit Bank, which is a state entity amongst others, and so on. Um, community trusts are, are allowed under the Magnuson-Stephen Act, known as regional fishing associations or fishing communities, or as in the case of the Pacific Council, they decide to call them community fishing associations. There's a precedent for this type of structure in Alaska with the community development quota corporations. But essentially, they func function like a land trust, holding assets in the public interest. Um, and effectively, uh, an Elizabeth We'll talk about this, I expect, on the Cape Cod issue. You're leasing quota to, to residents only at relatively low rates. Um, in some places, you're trying to reduce the competition with individual ownership, but support individual ownership. So you're trying to have caps on the portion that a quota, a community entity would hold. And you can also use them to create risk and insurance pools, something Joe will talk about, I hope. Um, We've put some 
work into this. There are resources, printed resources out there. Um, we held a workshop in Alaska to explore why the community quota entity program in Alaska isn't really working. Um, but we looked at nonprofit governance issues, finance, regulatory, lease management, accounting, a bunch of different things. Um, so just to point out, there's some, there are some uh, document resources out there to look at. This is an example of um, the letter that the um, city of Morro Bay sent to the Pacific Council talking about their, their um, reasons for trying to start a community quota bank um, in the Pacific groundfish fishery. They want to attract necessary financing to purchase historically important quota shares and anchor them in the community. They want to stabilize local fishing businesses and help Morro Bay Harbor infrastructure be maintained. Uh, they want to work together to reach a sufficient scale to reduce costs for individual smaller fishermen, so on and so forth. Avoid overfished species, reduce monitoring costs, create opportunities for new entrants that will ensure long-term stability and build capacity. That's a really big one. Um, we know that without leadership, these community entities and these program adaptations are not going to go anywhere. And I'll skim over this, but there's these structures, and it's changed since, and Joe can talk about it. And Joe, if you want to come back to the slide, we can pop it up. But it's a little complex, but um, people have tried to figure out how to hold these assets in a workable fashion within state and federal laws at the community level. And that's Joe's expertise. Um, We've started a help develop a network called the Community Fisheries Network, which is meeting later this week in San Diego, our third meeting in the last three years. It's uh, eight or ten um, and growing organizations from around the country that are trying to just work together to get up the learning curve faster. Um, but one of the issues they've started to work on is what should be the standards and the metrics by which different communities measure their way to those standards for what is a community-based fishery and what's a, what do we mean when we say sustainable community-based fisheries. Um, a lot of you know about the triple bottom line, social, economic, and ecological sustainability, not just the sustainability of fish stocks or shellfish stocks, but all the other components of what we mean when we say we're a, we're a functioning viable fisheries community. Um, Cape Cod Fisheries Trust has worked a lot on standards and, and metrics, um, and we have a draft set of standards that the network is going to be uh, further developing and hopefully sort of ratifying the first working draft that we can put out on the web later this week. But I think the important thing is you want to be able to connect that to the revenues and the stories behind brands that begin to say around the country there's an identifiable cluster of products and brands that are that are community-based sustainable fisheries that people will want because there will be a set of principles and a set of standards and a set of metrics that are highly flexible that different communities and different fisheries can say yeah that's the way we do it and it meets this standard and a, and a retail wholesaler will get that story. Um, Magnuson Act also mentions community sustainability <coughs> plans um, in different parts of the catch share section language. Um, no one's really provided any guidelines or what does that mean, so the network decided, uh, community in Oregon decided, hey, we'd like to put a draft on the table. So the network's going to do that and put that out there too, saying, okay, um, if you guys aren't going to define this, we will. And we'll take a triple bottom line approach and people can whack at it and we'll discuss it and we'll modify it obviously as we go forward. Sector, the sector program in New England, Joe, I think we'll mention, but sector, sectors which are essentially um, um, collaborative um, quota pools, you might say, are required to develop annual operations plans. And those are beginning to, in some way, look at proxies for how communities might want to operate. Um, we also have been working on these finance issues. All right, if you're going to have quota programs, you're going to generate these debt and finance issues. So what, what are we going to do about that? Um, there's loan funds out there. Um, 
There are permit banks which are being set up partly with private and federal funds and state funds in Maine and Massachusetts. Um, the challenges, of course, is how do you go raise the capital for that? Um, in Alaska, of course, in British Columbia, the banking system is, is well, is, uh, is very normalized to finance. Um, and that seems to work in large measure. Um, but these community entities are, are a strange animal and banks won't know how to deal with them. And so we've got to figure out the finance mechanisms a different way. Elizabeth's going to talk, I think, in depth about that. But we've had some experience there. It's not easy, partly because, you know, you have to have specialized capacity to do the fundraising. A lot of the monies that we uh, use to make uh, sub-market loans are, are based on grant funding sources. So one of the members of the national panel on community dimensions of cat shares, we had several private public finance pr panelists. And they said, look, we've really got to get this figured out because we could leverage public and private finance in partnerships and really make this work. One of the guys is a really interesting um, fund manager from Baltimore, Maryland, who's working on water quality issues in Chesapeake Bay for, for fisheries and shell fishery building there using private capital. It's, f it's fascinating. Um, I won't go into this too much, but basically the panel said, look, you should get out there and leverage public financing for this. Um, it's a good match with these community structures. Um, and I know this is also getting into the weeds, but you know, municipal and state bond issues are uh, another mechanism. In my town, which is a big fishing fleet town in Oregon, Newport, many of you know, um, we issued a $15 million bond four years ago to refurbish the dock infrastructure for the fleet. Okay, if we're gonna have groundfish quota systems, would, why wouldn't we issue another sizable bond and buy some quota up to the cap level, park it in the community trust and say, this is for the next generation Newport fishermen. It'll be available for five years to new entrants. After five years, we're hoping you bootstrap your income level up, you can maybe go buy a small portion of quota on your own. And that's the way the interaction between a, a community entity and a private individual would potentially operate. So, but there are other examples of where people have leveraged public and private funding to do these public interest, public trust operations. And fisheries, lest we forget, is a public trust asset. Um, I guess some of the take home lessons, and I don't know if we're getting anywhere on them honestly, is if you want communities to really thrive, you allocate, if you're gonna do a catch share thing, you need to allocate some of it to a community entity up front. Community development quota corporations in Alaska, they didn't necessarily get it up front, but they carved out 10% later on. They're thriving multi-million dollar community economic development engines. The CQE program, it's 42 or 46 small communities in the Gulf of Alaska that ended up, for various reasons, disadvantaged over time. They can set up community quota entities, but they have to buy the quota on the open market. And so far, only one or two have actually been able to pull that off. Um, we helped finance one of them, but basically that's a program that's diametrically opposed to the, to the other one. One's making it, one's not, and the reasons are fairly clear. Um, no leasing by retirees. In other words, when you get second generation captains, be owner on board, get back to that community level. It's a controversial topic for sure, but um, uh, there's lots of literature about that, especially from BC, its effect on communities and fleets. Um, I, you know, we can stick our necks out all over the place and say what should we do about catch share programs, and, uh, but I think I'll quit there rather than uh, uh, <laughs> go into the design issues. But we can come back to that in Q&A if, you, if you'd like, you know. Um, so there's, it's a controversial topic. Uh, and. There, there are things that uh, people really hate about it, and in some ways they've learned to adapt. Um, but I also think that, you know, exactly, but I think we need to uh, talk about the triple bottom line and not just get um, caught up uh, with uh, um, the ecological issues involved. 
Um, and we need to foster both business and community because that's the only way it's really going to function, I think. So, thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, the, Ed has demonstrated the complexity of the uh, health catch shares, the predominantly the triple bottom line. Um, I neglected to say earlier in the introduction that um, the way the format is going to be, we're going to, uh, for this workshop, we're going, Ed has presented, next will be Joe Sullivan, and then Elizabeth Bridgewater, and then we'll have about 30 minutes, if not more, of um, Q&A, and it's, um, the, the three presenters will be at the front of the room to answer any of your questions. Um, <coughs> Our next speaker is Joe Sullivan. Joe Sullivan is a partner in the Munt McGregor Law Firm in Seattle, Washington. He joined the firm in 1990. Prior to attending law school, Joe was a salmon fisherman in western Alaska from 1979 to 1987. Joe works with commercial fishermen of the Bering Sea, Gulf of Alaska, Pacific Coast, and New England ground fisheries, ground fish fisheries in and the Bering Sea crab fishery on corporate, financial, transactional, and regulatory matters with a concentration on matters related to allocation and use of federal and state fisheries access privileges. Joe also assists fishermen with forming and operating harvesting and marketing cooperatives, trade associations, sectors, and scientific research organizations, and with developing and implementing fishery co-management arrangements addressing salmon bycatch in the Bering Sea pollock fishery salmon and rockfish bycatch in the Pacific Coast whiting fishery, and the rockfish and halibut bycatch in the Pacific Coast multi-species groundfish fishery. In addition to his work with commercial fishermen, Joe has served three terms on the Nature Conservancy of Alaska Board of Trustees, represented the city of Kodiak in state and federal fishery allocation policy development, and been a consultant to the UC Santa Barbara Sustainable Fisheries Group and the Environmental Defense Fund. Joe is currently assisting the Nature Conservancy of California with matters related to use and the disposition of its 13 Pacific Coast Groundfish Limited Entry Permits and related quota shares. Joe. Thank you, Stephanie. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me and having me. Uh, Ed did a great job, I think, of covering some of the uh, complicated issues associated with the impacts on fishing communities of different types of fishery management allocations. Uh, what I'd like to do is start from the other, another perspective, one of the other perspectives. I'd like to start from the perspective of fishermen and fishermen's cooperatives. And I think we will work our way to some of the same issues that Ed's been talking about, but I'd like to try and do it from a little different angle. The first thing I'd like to do is start with just kind of a, a 101, perhaps, on fishermen's cooperatives uh, in the first place. There's a, the general lay of the land here is that under US antitrust law, there's a general prohibition on two or more individuals who are competitors in any type of business coming together as a combination or a conspiracy or a collective and jointly uh, restraining competition or agreeing to restrain competition. Now what does that mumbo jumbo have to do with fishermen's cooperatives? Well, essentially what that law means is that absent some type of exemption if two or more fishermen get together and say, let's agree on the price below which we will not sell our product, they've essentially agreed to undertake a per se violation of antitrust law unless they've got some type of exemption. And fishermen's, fortunately, fishermen's cooperatives are exempt from federal antitrust prosecution <clears throat> under the Federal Fishermen's Collective Marketing Act, which provides that fishermen coming together to collectively harvest, process, market, or sell their products can form associations to conduct that type of activity collectively 
And if they do it in compliance with the act, they're exempt from antitrust prosecution. But the reason I start with that point is that there, in the first place, is a general prohibition on undertaking this collective activity. And then there's an exemption that you can qualify for, but only if you undertake the organizational and uh, organizational steps to qualify and conduct your activities in compliance with the exemption. Fishermen's cooperatives have been around since the 30s. The Fishermen's Collective Marketing Act was passed in 1934. There have been fishermen's cooperatives operating on this coast for quite a long period of time that have come and gone. Uh, the, there was a very uh, active fishermen's cooperative in the uh, anchovy fishery. There have been others up and down the coast over time. Their primary function in their early days was to assist fishermen with price and delivery term negotiations. It was really about, and Congress recognized this when they granted the exemption, trying to level the playing field between <coughs> small independent producers, fishermen who were basically catching a commodity that once they had it in the boat had a declining life and a declining value, uh, facing the uh, highly vertically integrated, very well capitalized buyers of their pack who knew that they could essentially uh, work one fisherman against another if they were operating independently and essentially could work the price down to the point where it was just barely above the marginal cost of operations. That was a problem that was uh, recognized in both agriculture and fishing at the time. So Congress passed two exemptions, the Capper Volstead Act, which enabled farmers to collectively market their product, and the Fishermen's Collective Marketing Act that enabled fishermen to do the same thing. I, the, what I'd like to do is move through the evolution of cooperatives, at least as I've seen them, and then talk a little bit about what I see going on and what I've been working on lately, uh, just off the Central Coast. Uh, starting from that, beginning point of assisting fishermen with uh, marketing of their catch and providing them with more market power. Cooperatives in the uh, 1990s or so began to evolve to a mechanism that would make it possible for fishermen to allocate among themselves the uh, harvest rights or harvest shares in a specific fishery. Uh, the setting was that as we were approaching the 80s and 90s, in many fisheries, we were reaching the point where the harvesting capacity that was being employed in the fishery was reaching the point where it was at, full capa at the full capacity necessary to harvest all the fish that were available, <coughs> and in many cases exceeded that capacity. Uh, the result was that um, for the fishermen involved, it was an extremely difficult race for fish, kind of a cutthroat type of competitive setting where you were trying to maximize your share of the harvest at the cost of your buddy. And there were uh, some opportunities to be a very great winner, but there were also opportunities to lose it all if you had a bad incident with your boat during one of the short fishery openings. Uh, as a result of that situation, there was also uh, what an economist would call a dissipation of rents. In other words, there is a lot of money being dumped into competitive capacity in the fishery as people were competing with each other for catch shares that resulted in expenditures above and beyond the amount necessary to efficiently prosecute the fishery and deliver product to the customer. And that cost to society was perceived as being a waste, if you will, in connection with the efficient harvest and delivery of the resource. One approach to dealing with that was to move to catch share allocations. As Ed's talked about, that raises a tremendous amount of complex social and economic issues. <coughs> Trying to decide how you allocate fishery privileges. Who gets them in the first instance? Do they pay for them or not? Can they lease them to somebody else? Uh, who's eligible to hold them in the second generation and what conditions apply? Ed's done a really nice job, actually, of summarizing the wide range of very complicated issues associated with that kind of program. And my experience was in the 1980s and 1990s, as fishermen came into federal and state management processes and asked for assistance in dealing with this problem of overcapitalization and the race for fish, these issues were recognized early on. 
And what happened in a number of cases is the political process, rather the, or the fishery management process, which is essentially political, rather than producing a quota or catch share system, locked up. And it locked up because there were too many issues and they were too complicated. And in many cases, fishermen were faced with situations where they really were denied the opportunity to move forward with something they would have liked to. Specifically, there was a moratorium on individual fishing quotas. It ran for quite a period of time after the adoption of the Alaska Halibut and Sablefish IFQ program. And it was precisely because there was a very strong reaction among other fishermen in Alaska and fishing communities who were concerned that program would operate to their disadvantage. While that moratorium was in place, I was working with a lot of fishermen who said, hey, we've got the same problem that the halibut and sablefish fishermen had in Alaska. We'd like to have some kind of solution. And if it's not going to be individual fishing quotas, then we've got to start getting creative about what it, what it will be, because we need a solution. We can't continue to beat our heads against the wall like this. What we began exploring is an approach under which we would define what uh, we called a sector of the fishery. We would define a certain gear group of, that participated in the harvest of a certain species in a certain area during a certain period of time. And rather than try and nail down an individual allocation system that would give each participant in that sector some kind of governmental quota or governmental access right, what we began to pursue was the idea that the sector would pull together, define itself as a group go into the political process and say, look, rather than giving us individually governmental privileges that we can trade or transfer, draw up a corral around this sector of the fishery, identify the participants based on the folks who are there right now, and basically give us an arrangement under which we can reserve a certain amount of catch out of the total pool that's available to the folks who are participating in this sector that have agreed to operate together. What we used as the mechanism for pursuing that approach was a fisherman's cooperative. What we did was go to the participants in the sector and suggest to them that they try and find a way to build the organization that would support the infrastructure that would be necessary to actually manage that quota if they were able to receive it. Now, the first and, first and foremost, the function, pardon me, that they had to be able to perform was to be able to just keep track of what they were catching and make sure they didn't exceed their sector allocation. We had to be able to demonstrate that in order to convince the policymakers that this was a type of allocation they would, could responsibly consider even in the first place. We were fortunate that we found a number of settings where it was possible to do that and we were able to kind of break the logjam and get into an arrangement, develop an arrangement or two where we could actually show how this template would function. Ironically, the first one that I worked on involved only four companies, and they were four of the largest, most significantly vertically integrated fishing companies in the country. One of the participants in the original sector approach to allocation was Tyson Foods. Uh, American Seafoods out of Seattle was also in the group, and a couple other very large participants. It's ironic on one hand that we had them breaking this uh, new ground, but at what it really did is because they were such an extreme case, it actually got the Department of Justice's attention, it got the attention of a lot of other policymakers, and it enabled us to show that we could make this work. The next step after that, we went to a very different direction. We went to the catcher boats that were involved in the Pollock fishery in the Bering Sea. They were looking for some type of relief along the same lines. They were told they absolutely were not going to get an individual fishing quota program the reaction against halibut and sablefish IQs was still so strong that it was not going to, wasn't even on the agenda. They were able to build an approach under which they were able to form cooperatives, receive allocations of quota as a pooled allocation to the cooperative that they formed and manage it for their use. Because there was a lot of political brokering involved, as there always will be in these programs, their co-ops have to be affiliated with a processor in order to form. But they've managed to still, notwithstanding that relationship, to do very, very well at price negotiation. And I think they've got very good and well-functioning relationships at this point between their cooperatives and the processors to which they deliver. To kind of jump ahead to what I'd like to cover a little bit 
in terms of what's going on now, we're dealing with the, uh, I've been working for about the last uh, four to five years on matters related to the Pacific Coast, ground fish, trawl fishery that takes place in federal waters off the coast. There was a decision early on in connection with dealing with capacity, excess capacity in that fishery, and the need to reduce that capacity, especially because of some of the constraining rockfish fisheries, that for the uh, general ground fish uh, trawl group, the non-white and trawl uh, group, there would be an allocation of individual fishing quotas. The, basically, some of the people who were involved in the original design made their minds up that that was the right way to go in connection with that program. So, sure enough, the council worked through the process, allocated, allocated individual fishing quotas to the fishermen in that fishery, and basically said, okay, there you go. Well, the first thing that they realized was that the IFQs that they were allocated were essentially not functional in the sense that uh, there were some constraining species for which the total amount of poundage available to the coast was so low that if you divided it up into individual quota shares and then allocated it to fishermen based on catch history, what each, what each fisherman ended up with was an amount that was so ridiculously small that it hardly made sense to even set gear in the first place. The, the poster child is yellow eye rockfish. There were about 1,600 pounds total to be allocated coastwide. 1,600 pounds. So divide that up by roughly 160 participating fishermen. And it wasn't evenly allocated. Some of them got more, some of them got less. Some of them got zeros. There, the whole group of you know, fishermen at Fort Bragg received zero allocations of yellow eye in their suite of quota allocations. So then the question is, how do you go fish if you're fishing under a quota-based management system if you catch one of these yellow eye, you either have to have quota in your account or you have to get it from somebody else or you have to face a penalty action. Those are your three choices. Under those circumstances, how do you even leave the dock? What we ended up designing was what we call a risk pool. And we built it bottom up. We organized fishermen's associations in Fort Bragg and in the Central Coast, basically primarily from Morro Bay, and those fishermen agreed first, right off the bat, that the basic premise would be that in, even though they'd received individual fishing quotas, their IFQs for eight constraining species would be treated as a pool resource among all of them. They would define rules under which they would fish, and they would ensure each other to the extent that they are operating in compliance with those rules against a constraining species catch event. The basic premise is, if you're going to do insurance, you've got to know that you've got a policy that's being complied with. The example that I give is, if you're going to get fire insurance for your house, the insurer is going to want to have a policy that stipulates what you can and can't do in connection with being eligible for an insurance payment. And one of the classic examples is, if you're smoking in bed, no, you're not going to get an insurance payout when your house burns down. Well, in this case, what the fishermen did was designed a set of very, very specific fishing plans and fishing rules that would govern the operations in each of the areas where their associations were located. Those rules were developed by the fishermen involved based on their knowledge of those areas in that fishery. And they were, this was, I think, probably the most significant threshold event I've been, I can remember, you know, these are guys who, for years and years and years have been competing head to head. Knowledge of what you caught where and when was what made you valuable. It was your individual knowledge that made you a good competitor. And it was the last thing you were going to share with somebody with whom you were competing. Or at least you, were not, you weren't going to do it willing. More often than not, you guys would give somebody bad information rather than good information. The transformative moment was when faced with these circumstances the guys involved all said, enough of that. We can't afford that kind of activity anymore. Nobody in this group can afford an accident by somebody else. There isn't enough quota available for us to do it. And on top of that, we won't get our target species out of the water if we're playing those games with each other. What they all did was sat down, pooled their information on where they had hit constraining species rockfish over their years of experience, used that information to develop fishing plans and regional rules under which 
their association members would fish, and each member that signed on to fish in accordance with those fishing plans and regional rules received the benefit of the pool backing up their constraining species catch without limit if they were operating in compliance with the rules at the time they had an event. That pool took us a solid year of work from uh, both the structuring, the legal structuring, as well as the development of the fishing plans and the development of the regional rules. But it has been in operation since probably about uh, July, August this year. Uh, two primary associations that are participating are the Fort Bragg Groundfish Association and the Sustainable Groundfish Association out of Morrow Bay, but they're also working with another fisherman's cooperative located up in Ilwaco, Washington. There's significant difference in the species makeups in the two areas, and so they don't have a single pool, but they have essentially a memorandum of agreement under which they back each other up. And interestingly, one of the Iwako boats just came down to fish in California here recently. The first thing they did before they even started making the trip down was contacted the local organizations and said, can we have a copy of your rules and a copy of your fishing plan? And they are fishing in compliance with those associations' rules while they operate it down here. That's the basic premise of the rules of the uh, risk rule approach is that it's the local association that develops the rules and the folks from elsewhere comply with those rules. Uh, I forwarded a copy of the risk pool agreement to Stephanie so she'll be able to put a PDF of it up on your website. You'll be able to see what we did if you're interested. No? <laughs> Okay, well, we'll find another way. If you can't get it that way and you'd like a copy, I'll get it to you. Let's just talk afterwards, but I can make sure you get it if you're interested. To come back around to what uh, Ed was saying earlier, uh, on reflection, a number of the fishermen I've talked to in the Pacific Coast Trail Program have said, you know, frankly, if we had it to do over again, I don't know why we'd ask for individual fishing quotas in the first place. They are... They're more of an impediment than they are a benefit when you're dealing with small slices of constraining species catch like yellow eye rockfish. It, it just doesn't make sense to treat it as a quota trading market when you're operating in that setting. It makes a lot more sense to think of yourselves as being people who are collectively fishing against a pool of available fish, managing that collective to maximize the uh, opportunity to take your target catch and minimize the risk of hitting a constraining species, start there. Uh, to close, I think the, the thing that we're seeing next coming on the horizon, we have seen that the major seafood buyers are all now talking about uh, moving to traceability and sustainability and moving there in fairly short order. I don't know if you guys saw, but Target just announced that their, their new initiative to move to traceability and sustainability for all seafood, and it's not far off. What we are going to be facing over time, Walton's already, you know, the, the uh, Walmart stores are already headed that direction. They've already committed to that program. Others are doing the same thing. What we're seeing is that over time, the ability to show that you're managing, not just getting fish out of the water, but bycatch, habitat impact, uh, other, uh, significant issues along those lines are going to be just as important in achieving value as your ability to catch fish. The ability to show that you have a functional arrangement that addresses issues like bycatch and rebuilding constraining species is going to be part and parcel of selling the target species that you're catching in the first place. And so while this risk pool was originally done basically as a self-defense approach by the fishermen involved keep from getting killed off, basically, by an IFQ program that had some really significant issues. Long term, I think it's really something they'll be undertaking in order to capture the benefit of additional value, rather than to avoid the problems assess associated with uh, fractional quota allocation. Uh, at this point, rather than, than turn to some of the issues that Ed identified associated, that are associated with catch share programs, he gave you a real good flavor of what they're about. What I'd like to do is phase down on my presentation at this point when he and I 
pocket and are up at the uh, up in front of you all when we get to the question and answer section if you'd like to explore any of those issues if you'd like to talk about any of the things that he had up there that I've been working on along the lines of its community fishing banks or some of the other community stability measures I'm happy to talk to him about talk to you about it but in the meantime I'll leave it at that thank you Thank you, Joe. I think uh, one thing that I got out of Joe's presentation is that uh, we, as a fishing community, we can, as we can make some of the decisions, we can make a lot of decisions um, with pertaining to our own fisheries and, and our livelihoods if we choose to do so. Our next presenter, oh, and I will also provide links to all the references that all of our each of our presenters have um, referred to uh, when I post the video to this um, on the CFSB website so all of the handouts all of the the, um, the presentations that will all be um, included in that post our next presenter and last presenter Elizabeth Bridgewater she was appointed in 2006 as executive director of the community Development Partnership located in East Ham, Massachusetts. This community-based nonprofit nurtures a vibrant Lower Cape region by promoting environmental and economic sustainability, expanding up opportunities for low and moderate income residents, and preserving the unique culture and historic character of the region. Many of the CDP's programming is developed in cooperation with other nonprofits, municipal municipalities, and private enterprises. Prior to her appointment as executive director, Elizabeth served as the, exec as the director of economic development programs at the Community Development Partnership. An East Coast native from a fishing community in Massachusetts, Elizabeth began her career in Boston where she worked for several nonprofits, including the International Society for Protection of Animals, Thompson Island Outward Bound, ACCION International, and the Center for Women in Enterprise. During this time, she was involved in fundraising, program development, host, hosting international program tours, and managing entrepreneurial programs for women. Her accomplishments at the Community Development Partnership include the creation of a unique entrepreneurial program exclusive for artists, a technology training program for growing businesses, and the development of a strategic partnership with the Cape Cod Commercial Hook Fishermen's Association to ensure that local fishermen are able to access affordable fishing permits in order to preserve the Cape's day boat fishing fleet. She has also led the organization in the development of several award-winning affordable housing programs that focus on environmental stability, sustainability, and a community commitment to energy efficiency and conservation. Elizabeth has a degree in international relations from Bradford College and a, a master's degree in community economic development from South New Hampshire University. Elizabeth is an outdoor enthusiast who loves to travel the world on foot. She has hiked in the Pacific Northwest, the Utah Canyons, the mountains in North, Northern New Hampshire, the coast of Ireland, and throughout the woods and dunes in the Cape Cod National Seashore. She is also a student of classical voice and has been featured in many local theater productions and choral concerts. Elizabeth lives in Harwich, Massachusetts with her wife, Pam, and their beloved dingo dog, Summer. Elizabeth. Hi, everybody. <coughs> Stephanie, thank you for having me here today and welcoming me. This is my first time to um, Southern California, and it's absolutely gorgeous. I grew up in New England near the coast, and I was telling Ed over lunch that I, I've never uh, found another place in the United States that I ever wanted to live, except for maybe California, because I just love the ocean and the mountains. Um, Ed promised that I was going to say a whole bunch of stuff that I don't know if I'm going to deliver on that promise. And, um, and I also wanted to say my experience with the fisheries before four years ago was that my uncle was a lobsterman, my cousin was a ground fisherman, 
and my very first boyfriend in high school was a ground fisherman. And uh, other than that, I had no experience. It was just sort of in my family, and I got free lobsters occasionally, and you know, Uncle Fred was a cool boat captain in town, but um, I never got involved. And um, about four years ago, Paul Parker from the Cape Cod Commercial Hook Fishermen Association approached me in my capacity as executive director and said, um, there's something coming down the pike that's going to threaten our community, and do you want to hear about it and maybe get involved in a strategic partnership with us? And I said, sure, you know, what's going on? And that's the first time I heard about this coming catch share management <coughs> program. And basically what he said was, um, we're going to lose our fishing fleet. And I said, um, okay, the fishing fleet on the Cape actually exists in the region that the organization that I lead um, serves. We, the Community Development Partnership serves the eight towns of the, of the lower Cape, which if you can picture the geography, is the outermost portion of Cape Cod. And the fishing fleet is primarily in the ports of Chatham, Harwich, Wellfleet and Provincetown, and those are four of the eight towns that, that we serve. So when Paul said, you know, this is a threat to our community, you know, I immediately um, s sat up and took notice. We, we had done some loans to the um, fishermen out of Provincetown for um, equipment, because we have a microloan program already, but we had never done a sector-based initiative that targeted in a deeper way with this sector of our economy. And when Paul started telling me about the, um, frankly, the amount of money that local fishermen make, both for the boat captains themselves, but also the wages that the crew was earning, you know, I really sat up and took notice because the Cape Cod wages are pitifully low because we're primarily a tourist economy. And if you're a clerk in a retail store, you're just not making a lot of money. And so, I started to look at this program from a couple of different um, angles. Um, one was, you know, part of our mission is to preserve the culture and history of our region and what makes it special and, um, and our sense of place. And of course, um, if you look at the Cape Cod commercial, the Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce website, there's always a picture of a gorgeous fishing boat and that's a, a big part of what um, is a tourist draw, so um, from that standpoint. But also the wages were really important to me and the economic development um, and the shoreside businesses that the local fishing fleet supported um, felt really important to me. So, you know, Paul and I started talking about what the CDP could bring to the program and he, um, he said, I'm going to start raising some money and buying fishing permits because when this new catch share program goes into effect, if we don't hold some fishing permits in community trust, they're going to migrate off the Cape. And one of the reasons why is that it's a lot cheaper to live in other places in Massachusetts than Cape Cod. And this adjacent marine resource can get landed in a number of different ports that are not on Cape Cod. And the housing costs where we live are, you know, I don't, I don't know what the ratio is, but uh, for example, the average housing cost in Truro is about $600,000. You can rent an apartment in New Bedford for about $400 a month as opposed to $1,500 a month. So we're competing with livability costs and our fear um, at the CDP was that if we didn't hold some of these permits in community trust, then people that had choices about where to live and where to land fish um, based on the cost, we're going to migrate off Cape. So about, um, I don't know, I think it was five years ago, um, Paul Parker started raising money. I think he raised about $3 million. I wasn't involved in that aspect of it, but I know that a portion of that money that he raised came from the Ford Foundation. It was a million dollars in what's called a program-related investment at 1% interest, and the Ford Foundation in, you know, wanted to know how they were going to manage the, the uh, community quota. And one of the benefits to the strategic partnership that we developed was that we were going to be involved. It was one of the selling points that the Cape Cod Commercial Hook Fishermen Association basically sold to the Ford Foundation was that we got this other organization over here that doesn't have a bunch of fishermen on their board and therefore there's not the same kind of inherent conflicts of interest 
that happens when, when the governing body of the community asset directly benefits from that asset. Um, and then we had an infrastructure already in place with our microloan program of community decision making. And so the Ford Foundation came out, and I'm sure they, they spent a lot of time with um, the local fishing fleet, with the leadership at the Cape Cod Commercial Hook Fishermen Association, and then they spent a day with us too, because they wanted to know what our role was going to be, who, who were the members. They actually met the members that were on our um, community committee. They wanted to know who was going to be making the decisions and how they were going to be made. We couldn't answer that question in detail because we hadn't developed the real nitty-gritty infrastructure of the program, but we were able to give them a sense of how our expertise in um, our microloan program and also in our housing program was such that we knew how to develop a process that allocated resources in a fair and transparent manner. And that worked for them, and a and million dollars came to Cape Cod, and, um, and it was used to buy scholar permits. So the Community Development Partnership has primarily been involved in the management of the scallop fishery portion of the Cape Cod Fisheries Trust. And so that's what I'm going to focus on my, um, a lot of my comments on today. I, I'm not an expert in ground fish. We have a, a, a big ground fish fleet, and we have not, as an organization, got involved in that yet. So I won't be able to answer any questions about that. All right, so let me go to some slides. You said the space key? Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to probably overlap a little bit with what Ed said, but um, the um, Atlantic Sea Scallop Management is um, managed by the New England Fisheries Management Council, and there are two segments of the fleet. And I find this, being a newcomer to fisheries, I thought this was really fascinating, that um, the limited access fleet is actually the boats that go out uh, for weeks at a time and have a lot more access than the general category fleets, which have a lot more limited access <coughs> than the limited access. So I don't know who decided to name it that, but I find language to be a really powerful tool. And my cynical side said that wasn't an accident. Um, up until the catch share program, it was primarily managed through effort control, basically um, how many days at sea you had, what type of gear you could use, and um, how many pounds you could get per trip. And, and you know, again, as a newcomer, I saw that as, Let's make it as inefficient as possible for the fishermen to actually make any money in order to, you know, reduce their ability to take fish out of the ocean. And, um, and I, a lot of the, um, the guys that I met echoed that um, sort of <coughs> assumption that I made when I was learning about it. So the catch share system um, went into effect for the scallop fisheries in um, March of 2010. So this is fairly new in New England. And, you know, Ed talked about this. It was designed to um, reduce overfishing, bycatch habitat degradation, um, to restore fisheries um, in New England. And, um, and as Ed said, it was basically, I, I call it a pie. You know, there's so many pounds in the pie. Every year, the, um, the federal government tells you how many pounds that are going to be in that pie based on the biomass um, health. And then each um, fisherman that got a contribution factor gets figures out how many pounds they have that year. So every year you find out what you get to fish that year. And that includes what we own in community trust as well. This last bullet says um, the catch share system does not prioritize community or social concerns. And, and so that's where we come in. We're trying to um, address those community and social concerns. So. Um, here are some of the factors that went into effect when the catch share system was created in New England. Actually, it's not just for New England. It went, because for the scallop fleet, it goes all the way down to the mid-Atlantic coast. Um, the general category, which is the day boat fishermen that we're involved in. And, and let me just say, one of the reasons why the day boat fishermen are prevalent on the Cape is because of our geography. In Chatham, where there's um, a significant amount of the fishermen fish out of the port of Chatham, the cut coming into the um, harbor, you can't get a boat in there over 50 um, feet. So just the um, geography alone um, w uh, informs what kind of um, fishing fleet we have on the Cape. The Provincetown, which has the deepest harbor, um, it happens to just be a longer 
um, steam away from uh, the um, the biomass. So I think the fleet tends to be smaller as a result of that. You don't see a lot of the big boats that you see out of um, New Bedford or Gloucester on Cape Cod. Um, the eligibility is that uh, the boat captain had to have landed a thousand pounds in any year from 2000 to 2004. As a result, they got a contribution factor. Um, Joe talked about um, this in the, I don't remember what the um, species was, or what, I'm not familiar with that, but we saw this where some of the guys got 2,000 pounds. I mean, it was just you couldn't even leave the dock with 2,000 pounds. Um, other guys got 25,000 pounds. It was based on, you know, what they had done um, over that four-year period. Some of the accumulation caps, um, you can't harvest more than 2% of the total, and um, any one entity can't own more than 5% of the total. And when we say total, we're talking about the um, general category. And when you look at the total pie of scallops, the limited access boats get 95% of the pie, and the general category get 5%. So when we talk about the ownership cap, we're talking about 5% of 5%. So here are some of the catch share implications. I'm not going to belabor it because Ed talked about that, but we've seen this happening on the Cape. Um, it's the quota is freely tradable, can be bought and sold, um, and this is exactly what happened. It, the, the prices are escalating. When Paul was doing his um, fundraising to buy the initial um, scallop quota, it was at $6 a pound. Right now we're seeing a deal in front of us at $32 a pound only four years later. We bought some scallop quota, the CDP, from the Hook Fishermen Association in June at $20 a pound. So that's how rapid the prices are escalating. And eventually, I imagine, like every bubble, it's going to burst and the prices are either going to stabilize or come down. Um, large companies that have a competitive advantage are um, either because they have uh, multiple boats in their fleet or because they own other related vertically integrated businesses like, food, um, like processing or distribution companies, just, they, they just have more access to financing than a boat captain that's going out um, one trip at a time. And so what we're seeing is some of the, some of the in the early days of uh, this new system going into place, a lot of the permits migrated off Cape immediately. Um, some of the day boat fishermen sold their quota because they had equity. I mean, that was the benefit. I think Joe said that. They got instant equity overnight. Um, some other effects, the new entrants can't finance, um, and I think um, Ed did a really nice job of laying out the economics. I think the um, pricing that you would put up for the SANE boat in Alaska is identical to the pricing that's going on in Scallop. So, um, and then what we're seeing with the boat captains is um, a tradition of a deckhand coming up behind the captain, working hand in hand, the boat captain working on the deck with the crew members and basically grooming that next generation. We're seeing that, um, <coughs> that tradition changing slightly because now the boat captains are taking out uh, greater um, loans and greater risk in order to buy into the system and so they have to make up that difference somehow and so we're seeing crew wages cut um, we're seeing some boat captains not even actually fishing. They're just behind the wheel and they've got the crew doing the work. Uh, we're seeing uh, deferred maintenance, um, skimping on insurance and safety equipment, and then specialization where um, right now the scallop uh, quota, or rather the scallop prices, are as high as they've ever been at um, 10 to $11 a pound. And so it's, a gr it's an opportunity right now that's pretty attractive. And so the fleet is trying to buy as much um, scallop quota as they can um, at the expense of buying some other um, species that would help um, diversify their portfolio. Some of the benefits to catch shares that are anticipated is that overfishing will diminish. Um, on the Cape, it's called derby fishing, where the, um, you know, the fisheries is open. You don't know when it's going to close. And no matter what time of year it is, you've got to go out and get what you can get. 
And, um, and so there was a lot, I know in the scallop fleet, it's one of the most dangerous um, fisheries that we have in New England. And I think um, some of the most um, the highest number of injuries were happening in that um, fleet. The X vessel price has improved. We've seen that just in the last couple of years. It went um, up to $11 a pound. It was, I think the first year we um, ran the program, it was at $8 a pound. The next year it went up to um, 11. So even in one year, we're seeing the um, profit for the um, boat go up. For those that got a contribution factor, they got instant equity on March 1st, 2010. And that's, that is a benefit to them. Um, for those that didn't, no benefit there. Um, and then uh, through the Cape Cod Fisheries Trust and other community programs, we have the opportunity to stabilize. And I'm going to talk a little bit. I, I told Stephanie I'd talk about the good, bad, and the ugly, because um, I'm going to talk about what it's been like actually creating this program on the ground and dealing with some of the questions directly from the fishermen. Um, so let me tell you a little bit how it works. Um, the Cape Cod Fisheries Trust buys uh, ground fish and scallop quota. Early on it was at low cost, now it's at high cost. Um, we've, we've actually toyed around with different ways of describing what it is. We've called it charity, we've called it a grant, we've called it a subsidized lease, we've called it a straight up lease. Um, we're only in year, we're heading into year three of the program, so it, we're still building it, you know, even as we talk uh, today. And, but basically the priorities are local uh, boat captains that are on the boat. Um, we're trying to preserve um, a small day boat fishing tradition on Cape Cod. And so one of the eligibility criteria is you have to captain your own boat. If you have a health issue or, you know, there's some emergency and you still want to get your boat out there, that's, that's an exception, but in general you have to be on your boat. And we're trying to um, establish a model that be, can be shared with other communities. Those are some of the priorities. So the guiding principles are supporting the future generation, encouraging diversification, and then providing business support. Now, I'm going to talk about that a little bit as we go. So here's the history. The program was launched in 2005. In 2007, the um, actual legislation was created. In 2009, um, the Cape Cod Commercial Hook Fishermen approached um, the CDP. And, um, and in 2010, the first uh, scallop allocations were made. This is the business model. And you'll see that the Cape Cod Commercial Hook Fishermen Association in black is looming. They own almost you know, the entire fisheries trust. And you'll see that we overlap with a little bit because we just bought a small piece of uh, scallop quota from them. The reason we bought it is because when um, they were buying scallop quota, they didn't know what the total pie was going to be. And Paul was basically making a guess of what 5% was going to be. He knew that there was going to be a cap, but he didn't know what 5%, uh, he didn't know what the denominator was. In fact, we didn't know what the denominator was until February of 2010 and the fisheries opened in March in 2010. So it was kind of an interesting ride dealing with that level of uncertainty. But what happened was the federal government said, you're over your cap, you know, sell it. And so to keep it in community trust, they approached us and we, we bought it from them. Um, so the lease payments pay down the debt that um, was used to buy the quota, but it doesn't pay for any of the staff time. And, Part of the reason this slide is up here is because a lot of the fishermen in the fleet didn't understand that. As we were running the program, there was a prevailing belief, and I don't know how it started, um, that somehow um, the staff of both organizations were um, using their lease payments to you know, create jobs for ourselves. And it became an issue of contention between the fleet and the staff. And um, so we have done a lot of education on what our own business model looks like to help dispel some of the um, issues that have come up. Basically, we fundraise to pay our salaries, and, um, and the actual lease payments go to pay down the debt. So we're trying to create a, a strong fishing economy. We're trying to help create bankable businesses on the Cape, uh, profits for the captains, um, fair wages for the crew. 
diversified fishing businesses and um, supporting sustainable business practices. And you know, the, the, um, some of the characteristics of the scallop fleet in year one was um, that they didn't have, uh, some of them hadn't done their taxes. And I don't know if that's a, an issue that's out here on the West Coast, but the Cape has a very robust underground economy and it's not just in the fishing industry. And um, so when we um, rolled out the program in year one, we gave an exemption for that because we felt like, you know what, this is the way this fleet's operated for years, and who are we to say, you know, you're going to change this quickly? But we did give a one-year runway, and we said in year two, you, you got to have your taxes done in order to be eligible for the program. Um, the CDP had even though there's no, there was no federal money in this program, but we've had um, a lot of federal money flowing through the organization that I run, primarily for affordable housing um, development and for our microloan program. So my board of directors was very oriented towards having some formality to your uh, tax obligations. And so I had to do a little bit of finagling with my board to make sure I got that exception in year one because I think three out of the 11 guys that participated wouldn't have been eligible. So um, I'm pretty good at making a case with my board and everybody that applied got into the program. Everyone that applied the following year, including the three guys that hadn't done their taxes, were all tax compliant in year two. For me, that was an, a, a good outcome in year two. And, you know, part of the reason, and this came directly from uh, one of the guys in the fleet, was he said to me when I was asking for a letter of support for a grant that we were writing, which is actually tax dollars now, <laughs> um, he said, just your application guidelines alone has helped me um, develop my business better because I wouldn't have had all my financials in the, in the format that your application requirements um, need to be if you, you know, if you hadn't asked me to do that, because we asked them to write a business plan, we asked them to um, do some cash flow projections, and a lot of them had never done that before in that type of format, and we helped them along the way. And so just the actual application itself was helping them get, get a sense of what their um, numbers were all about. So this is, pardon me? It's 5.30. Are you giving me the hook? <laughs> so this is what the fleet looks like um, in year uh, 2000. In the, I think that's Stephanie's job. Are you giving me the hook? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, we got uh, 11 guys this year. The trust owns between the two organizations about 200,000 pounds. And um, we're, we've made a commitment to lease it at 50% of market value. And right now that is at, um, actually year one we leased it at 70 cents and it was leasing on the market at um, $1.50. This year we leased at $1 and it was leasing on the market at $2. And um, in this coming year we're looking at $1.50 and it's leasing at $3. So we're following the trend but we want something in return for being under market value and that is um, we want you to be on the boat, we want our boat captains on the boat, we want local crew on the boat and we want the crew to have a fair crew share. Because again, we're trying to build equity for our little crew and we're trying to keep <coughs> a local crew on Cape Cod because our fear is if they're not local, when that next generation of fishermen turn over and those assets turn over, they're gonna leave Cape Cod and with it all the revenues that go with it. So again, I'm looking at it from an economic development standpoint. This has been an interesting um, issue for us on the Cape, is the local crew. And again, to go back to the housing costs. So we have a, we have a fleet that's committed to hiring local crew, but because of the housing costs and um, some other factors, Namely, um, at least this is what they're reporting to me, um, a high drug use of the crew members. They're trying to find uh, crew, responsible crew anywhere they can get them. And, um, and that's an issue that we're grappling with because we know that's real, especially the housing issues. We know it is a real issue. So, you know, as a program manager, we're trying to figure out how to 
help them with that issue. Some of the other um, program eligibility, um, I actually already went through this, so I'm not gonna go through it again. Um, one of the other issues that came up in the program in uh, the first couple years was they wanted to know how we were making the decisions. So you've heard a lot of the eligibility requirements and what some of the program guidelines are, but the actual who gets what of a finite resource is a really dicey thing when you're talking about a really tiny community of basically 11 to 18 scallopers in our community. And they all know each other, and when we give out the allocations, we did it face-to-face -face, uh, in a meeting, and the minute that guy left the room, everybody who was waiting to go into the meeting knew what, you know, knew what he got, and by the end of the day, everybody knew what everybody got. But nobody knew why they got that, and he got that, and, and they were legitimate questions. You know, and, uh, and so this year we've spent a lot of time leading up to the allocations, because we're in that build up time right now, um, both educating them on how the decisions are made, but also asking them to help us in creating a fair process. So there's certain sticking points that we won't um, move on, like you have to be on the boat, we want you to have a local crew, you have to be tax compliant, things like that. But there are other issues that we did want their input on, like what should be a cap? You know, like do you give everything to only five guys or do you give, you know, do you spread it out over all 13? And, and uh, how do you prioritize the next generation and, and that sort of thing. So we've been dealing with, um, we've been dealing with meeting after, we've had probably like 10 meetings in the last three months going over detail after detail to get input. I can see the hook coming when she stood up. One last issue that I want to talk about, and then I'll close, is the issue of inurement. And Joe is probably really familiar with this because this is a term that uh, the IRS uses. It's a legal term. And um, this is one of the big challenges that we <coughs> had with the program, and that is um, and I think Ed alluded to this too, having um, community ownership of an asset that needs to be used for charitable purposes. And when you're dealing with a fleet of fishermen who are used to, I mean, are used to having their own wits and physical capability and ingenuity and like in the moment decision making, you know, individualism, all the things that make a successful fisherman out on the water, um, having to interact with like community ownership, the, almost like the two things didn't really kind of easily gel together. And, um, and, I, and I totally understand that. Like our whole uh, sort of framework of community ownership is almost diametrically opposed to the psyche that makes somebody who wants to be on the water like that successful. And one of the things that we had to really talk about was this inurement issue because the thing that came up was, you know, just give it to us. Just, just give it to us and we'll use it. And uh, we don't need to have any requirements and we don't need to divulge any of our financial statements to you and we don't need to actually give you anything back. And, um, and that's, um, that's actually against the law. And you as a nonprofit owning something in community trust, there has to be some social or community benefit. And the local fishing fleet didn't really understand that. And so there was a lot of tension between us and them as a result of that. So, and we didn't anticipate that. We sort of figured there'd be inherent knowledge that getting something for less than market value was a benefit. And instead, it was, you know, a sense of just, you know, why don't you just give it to me? And um, so we had to do a lot of education around this inurement issue, and I had never even heard of that word. We all learned some things about that. Um, so I'm going to end there, and I won't, I'll, I've got some other you know, details about the program, but I'm going to leave it for the question and answer. And uh, again, I want to thank Stephanie for asking me here, and thank you for listening, and I'm, I'm delighted to answer any questions about the program. Sit up front for a question and answer. We have about 30 minutes maximum 
for questions. We will be getting together for um, a informal reception at the Endless Summer if you'd like to continue your discussions um, with each other and with our presenters. Um, I, have, I actually have a question for Elizabeth. Do you, any of the fishermen who qualify for your loans, do they ever get to, do they ultimately lease those quotas? Or do they, or do they eventually get to buy them at all from the trust? The, um, no. No, they don't get to buy them from the trust. Yeah. 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 Say that again? You're, you're, you're renting? Yes, it's all, yeah. So like, you know, be familiar with EDC anymore. Yeah, the, what's, what's in the trust is for lease only. The, um, one of the things that we're exploring right now, though, because our, part of our mission and our intention is to help the fleet build up their own wealth, is um, doing a cooperative deal. Because the market right now is frozen. There's very little scallop quota that's for sale right now, and it's because the prices are so high. And individual fishermen in our fleet can't, what comes up for sale, they can't, uh, by themselves, they can't afford to buy that piece because it's so big. So we're actually in the middle of exploring a situation where we're pulling together five or six of the guys to buy with us. And we'll take a small portion of that, use some of our assets to help them buy their own piece, and we'll keep a small portion in community trust. So they would own, yeah. that those, they would own part of it and they would lease part of it from you in that aspect? In, of it. in this situation, it's a private seller and we would buy it together, and when we sit at the closing table, they'll walk away with their ownership piece, and we'll walk away with ours. But you still have, I'm okay. sorry, that, one more question. Um, yeah. You still have a cap, you as, a, as an organization? Yeah, we're, we, we own 1.86% right now. So we actually have excess capacity to buy, but trying to find that balance so that you're not competing with right. the fleet themselves is a, is a balance. I have a quick question. Um, being that the East Coast, particularly where you're from, and you discuss uh, scallops as a commercial fishery, I'm just curious, do you remember roughly historically before uh, cat shares came around, how many active boats there were relatively fishing? You know what, I, I wasn't active in the fisheries before that, but I'm going on memory and it was about 30, I think, 30 or more in the scallop fleet. Like what you mean? No. You can't. Okay, I didn't think so. And how many do you actually have that are productive boats that are fishing there? That are active in the trust, there's 11. No, I meant in the fishery. In the entire fishery? That's what I was Of Cape Cod? I don't know. No idea. No, because I, I, like I said, my experience is working with the scallop fishery. That's what I'm talking about, the scallop fishery. Yeah, there's what, between what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, <coughs> what did the scallop fishery look like before pet shares? It as was far as bigger. How many active fishermen there were, yeah. and how many active fishermen are there now? In Less. Comparison? I don't know the exact numbers. Roughly, We're not thirty yeah. to like eleven to fifteen. It has Less. definitely shrunk. Yeah, I think you'll I think see I that that's accurate a, numbers. In that. I, I, I think you'll see that's a, a, I, I'll a I'll consistent, you, but a consistent trend it has shrunk. that you see across the country. Which trend Where, is that? When you get catch shares, you see consolidation and reduction of fleet sizes. It's a, it's, a cons it's a fairly consistent pattern that I'm aware of. And that's why we have tried to work on these community structures, because we're like, OK, we're not the, we're not the policymakers. And so we're trying to figure out how to adapt to that. So I understand the issue and the question, but you know, the entities that we work with are working on adaptation, not the policy. That's great. So, you know, it's a different, different environment um, in which those kind of decisions are made. And so I think what we're talking about here is adaptation strategies to try to deal with the policy that you get in a, uh, in a politically very challenging and strong environment, the councils, right? And so right. And our idea behind cap shares is to come within certain mandate and constraints of Magnus and Stevens and act and comply. Right, and I think, I think you see uh, a diversity of ownership rules of the game around the country, too, when you 
look at all the different cat share programs that you end up with through the council process around the country, they're very diverse in terms of what Cape Cod Fisheries Trust can do, um, entities in Alaska <coughs> cannot do, for example. Um, the ownership rules in the ground fish fishery in the Pacific Coast are kind of wide open. Um, so you get, a, you get a plethora of results um, depending on what council you're dealing with. So, so what you're saying is there, there's a lot of different tools that you can use to make pet shares look different depending on what the fishery looks like. That's right. Right. Uh, it's, it's typically the council that has the last say on the mechanics of going to a pet share program, not necessarily the fisherman. The fisherman's going to have input, he's going to get his voice heard, but it may not necessarily be heated. I think, that's I think that's absolutely right. I think the challenge for fishermen is, is both to be engaged on the front end, to the extent you can be, in the design mm -hmm. process. But on the other hand, frankly, you've got to build your safety net to deal with whatever comes out the other side. And absolutely. I, you know, the thing that I've been impressed with, with the Pacific Coast group I've been working with, is they got handed something that didn't work very well at all. That's working really well now because they essentially took what was a quota share based program and turned it back into something that was more like a collective fishing arrangement. And so, it, just because it comes out looking like something that is an optimal doesn't mean you can't take it and work with it. It really depends, to a significant degree, from my perspective, it depends on whether the players involved want to work it as a as an individually competitive market based approach to quota management and want to treat it as an opportunity to make money in a market, either by leasing or by trading in quota, or whether they want to look at it as an asset that's going to support fishing activity, and ideally an asset that'll support community-based fishing activity. Right. And it, so the challenge in many respects is the fishermen, the challenge to the fishermen themselves. What do you want to do with this? In halibut and sablefish, I think the choices have been made. That program is a market-based approach to dealing with fishing quota. There are market trades in quota, it's a commodity. It the players very in that much for the local fishermen now. It, pardon me? It didn't leave a whole lot of access for No, I think it's I think you're precisely right. But that kind of market approach to trading quotas makes it difficult for somebody who doesn't have either a lot of quota initially allocated to them or a lot of capital in their pocket to get in and play. Absolutely. But I think we're we're more sophisticated than that now. And I think we realize you can you can no, do something. Like you're giving us a lot of credit. <laughs> no, I think we are, really. I think we realize the consequences of that approach. And on the front end, you can engage the council on design as to whether or not you even want that kind of quota in the first place. Mm -hmm. The council or whomever you're dealing with. But then on the, the other idea here is, you know, you can, once these allocations come down, they can be treated very differently depending on how you approach the program in the first place. Right, but those changes can be real slow. Anytime you start, can be. Um, I got maybe a question for you first. Okay. And we'll talk about. Uh, let's say I wrote some stuff down here. Uh, the risk pool. Yes. In Fort Bragg to Morro Bay, there's not that many boats, so I would say that the the quota in that risk pool isn't real big. But if you had a lot of boats, you'd have a bigger pool. Mm -hmm. What happens when, and it'll happen, in my experience, you're gonna find years when fish that are in that risk pool are gonna get caught. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes by accident, sometimes by some person that doesn't care. Mm -hmm. And you use the risk pool up in the middle of the year. Mm -hmm. Does that then shut the fishery down till the first of next year? Yes. Or do they get to keep fishing? No, the simple answer is you're shut down for the rest of the year. The simple answer here is that the, there are quotas allocated for every single species that are being caught. There are constraining species like yellow eye rockfish where you've got a very small amount, 1,600 pounds for the coast, I guess, is the current uh, amount. When that amount's gone, there's no more fishing. So th what has happened is the, the approach has become much more conservative on managing risk in the first place because there really isn't a very good second best. And the rules, consequently, are very conservative, and the rules are very rigorously enforced. And as a result, there have been very, very few 
catch events of the concerning species and the events that we have had have been very small. Fishermen are, are fishing far more carefully than they would otherwise because we're in an extreme situation. Uh, I think the, and, and you know, uh, a trade-off here, I think the quota-based system, because of this thin and patchy distribution, a lot of this constrained species quota is kind of a difficult machine to work with here. But the flip side of it is, I think having uh, absolute limits on the take of these constraining species has actually been good for the market. I mean, what people understand is there, there is a hard cap, and that actually makes a difference to the folks who are concerned about sustainability. Thank you. Well, I'll have one more question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, in community-based shares, so say that Santa Barbara wants to have a community-based share, who decides where the boundaries are of that community? Is it just Santa Barbara or is it Ventura <laughs> and Oxnard? Right. And can the fishermen that have the quota in that community fish in other areas outside their community? And can the boats from other communities come in and fish in their community? Yeah, you know, typically that's a, it's a really good question. And it's something we are, that, that most of the people we're working with are struggling with because let's say, for example, uh, what you usually get out in the case of Alaska halibut and tablefish, you get defined geographic boundaries that the quota is attached to. So Southeast Alaska, it's called Area 2C. <coughs> so you're buying quota for that particular area. So you can go fish in that particular area. I don't think, um, I think what some communities are, are struggling in, and they have to be careful what, what they wish for. They're kind of trying to establish uh, um, you know, these sort of uh, zones of exclusivity. And I, I think that's probably a dangerous place to go. Um, the, other, the other questions which NOAA and the councils haven't really defined for anybody is, could you have more than one community fishing quota entity in a community? Could it represent more than one community? And what, is, what are the geographic boundaries of that? I, I actually think that the best way to, to work on it is to have communities start working on it rather than getting necessarily rules from on high. Um, unless you're getting area-based management from the start in the design of a catch share program, um, which you have in British Columbia and you have in the salmon sector in Alaska, you get, a, you get an area M permit or whatever. Um, so it gets defined several ways, but I think at this community, I've, I've heard some communities talk about community stewardship areas which are beyond three miles, um, partly state waters, partly out into federal waters, but they would like to show that their community sustainability plan is focused mm -hmm. on that particular geography that's the usual and customary footprint of that fleet. And as you know, some of you know, most of you may know, the Ecotrust has worked a lot on these fisheries knowledge mapping projects where people are really defining their fisheries footprint over the course of their whole career. and the relative economics of that footprint. And so those footprints across adjacent communities are now fairly well understood and established, especially as you're trying to work out uh, ocean use <coughs> conflicts with, let's say, wave energy development in Oregon. That's one of our scenarios at the moment. So, but I, I think that the solution from that has come from the dock up, not from the council table down or not from the state fishing game council down. We, had a, excuse me, we had a, a fellow come from Japan a few years ago, and they have community-based fishing quotas, and you can't fish outside that right. quota. And the, the part that was good, the sport fishermen can't fish in your area, and when you get old, you can take sport fishermen out on your boat fishing in your area. Right. Which So you're trapped in this little area, and for fishermen here, in California, a lot of them move up and down the coast. Mm -hmm. If you're screwed, if there's, like here this year, there wasn't very much fish at all because of water condition. If a fisherman couldn't have moved, he would have been dead. Right. So the way I would answer that is we're, we are both the Cape Cod Commercial Hook Fishermen Association and the CDP are mission driven. And our mission is a geographic region. And so we do define what that geographic region is, that the fish needs to be landed within that geographic region. And there's no fundraising constraints on our ability to say that. 
the reason why it's important is because we're out on a peninsula, and so we actually have geographic constraints that really define our ability to make money in our region. And so it's important to make that a priority. However, where that actual boundary is has come up for debate. Is it the bridge? Is it right over the bridge? Um, before the bridge was there and the canal was there, the Cape was a lot bigger. So we threw that question to the fishermen so themselves. So you have a quota available in a number of different areas or just one area? Well, it's owned by two entities that, that reside and that are located on Cape Cod. And b by eligibility requirements, we say you can't lease this for, from us unless you land it in one of our ports. Now, if for some reason there was some huge environmental issue or the biomass in our region diminished dramatically and our entire fleet had to go to Maryland, which has happened, we would revisit that issue if they lived on the Cape. So you're saying based where you are, yeah. say you're in Santa Barbara and I'm in San Francisco and I want some quota. You can't get it. I can't get it. No. It stays where you are in your area. Yes. Because our mission is economic development for our to region. It's not San Francisco. Yeah. It's Santa Barbara. You know, that's our priority. Something I, I'd add in connection with your question. I, first off, I, I want to reinforce the comment that Ed, comments Ed and Elizabeth both made. We're at a stage in, in the process nationally or at state level in terms of fishery management, fishery allocation, where communities are not well recognized as stakeholders. And you can't count on the process to define communities into the mix as a stakeholder and accommodate their interests. The communities are going to have to step up and take responsibility of inserting themselves into the process as a stakeholder and define their roles. And so it's, it's definitely at a bottom up point. One thing I would say is I, I'm hearing from a lot of the folks that I work with that they think, the fishermen that I'm working with on the Pacific Coast issues, that with respect to some species like rockfish that are highly resident, that it really does make a lot of sense to start talking about area-based management where you have a relationship between a local fleet and you have a resource that's relatively resident and you can put together a situation where you can basically establish a co-management kind of regime where the fleet is working with the fishery managers and the market to optimize the long-term <coughs> yield and value of that, of that resource. That, I think, is a wonderful endpoint that we'd like to be working toward. That's a very different situation than dealing with Pacific Whiting, for example. I mean, that stock's all over the place. It's highly migratory. It fluctuates a lot. Trying to set up a, an area-based management approach to catching Pacific Whiting, where you're going to try and anchor exclusive rights in a community, I think you're going to drive yourself crazy. And we so have the I, same situation with some fish we have here where that fish is moving all the time yeah. and boats are coming from other places following it. When they get into our area then, we have to tell them, nope, stop, you can't come here anymore. Right. Just we get the fish here. Right. That doesn't, does that work good? Well, no, it, it <laughs> hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what we've done this year, again, that we haven't had any luck with that approach. But what we have had some really good luck with is, okay, if you're fishing on a migratory stock that's moving through this area and you've got bycatch, of rockfish, for example, that's really sensitive, what we are going to insist on is that you fish by our rules. You may come in here and fish for that migratory stock, but fish when, where, and how we tell you, that's so that we don't good. have excess bycatch of this sensitive species, and we don't have to worry about the mess you left behind when you're gone. And we're getting more and more recognition from fishermen in the fleet that that makes sense, that, that there need to be some local rules that are respected when it comes to dealing with the secondary impacts. Like are those rules are mainly self-regulated? Yes. Paul, did you have a question? Yeah. Is, is this just a ground fish issue, or are all our fisheries going to be mandated to have a pet share program? I'd say it's really hard to say where we're going to go from here with cat shares. I, it's a very complicated political setting. <coughs> is there a mandate for cat shares? Right now? No. There's no, there's no mandate at this point. Uh, there has been more pressure and less pressure over time. We were in a situation over the last couple of years where I think there was a national initiative at the federal level to move in further into catch share programs around the country. I think there's been a tremendous amount of pushback 
in connection with that. And as a matter of fact, there's a bill floating around in Congress right now that would basically cut off funding for any new cat share programs because of the sum of the controversy associated with it. So I don't think you, you should be making any assumptions that it's going to go any further in any specific fishery. What I'm hearing from councils right now is the fishery management councils at the federal level are kind of waiting to hear from their constituents whether they want to go or not. I'm not seeing councils pushing it a lot on their own initiative because the political pushback is, is pretty strong. When you get into state waters, I think it really varies by region as to how they perceive the benefits and the, and, and the trade-offs associated with it. So I wouldn't say it's something you've got to necessarily assume is just coming down the pike whether you like it or not. I think it's much more a situation where it's a tool that's out there, it is being used. If, if it seems like it would fit in your situation, there are some resources you could pick up and work with, but I don't think it's something you've got to worry about getting dropped on yet under the current state of affairs. Henry, Henry, then Charlie. Oh, Henry. Henry. Um, <laughs> the, the King Crowd, there was a question over there regarding uh, fishermen's voice in the process. I think that Cape Cod Hook uh, Fishermen Association formed to, to um, kind of get a voice on the council, and they worked really hard to get somebody on, on, on their council who understood, understood their issues. So that, that, that's why the association formed in the first place, and they're very successful in um, getting representative representation. You know, what, you know what shocked me, though, coming in uh, to this as a total newcomer, is that in spite of that voice on the council, that when the catch share program was implemented in Massachusetts, there was no, um, there was no provision for the next generation and you know that council could have decided to set aside a portion of the total pie for the next generation because I mean I, I, I don't other than a community owned quota program I don't know how the next generation is going to buy into the system and I think it frankly I think it sucks I, I can't I mean I, I meet guys that who have come from generation of fishermen <coughs> And you know, because their dad didn't happen to be fishing in those four years and they didn't get a big contribution factor, they're not, they're, you know, where do the, how do they follow? You know, and some of them don't want to, but some of them have a passion they want to. And the council could have made that choice. And I think, you know, that's where my community organizing kind of back gets up. Like, if this is coming down the pike, I think, you know, some strong community organizing around what's going to happen for that next generation needs to be organized. Yeah, uh, you know. That didn't happen in Massachusetts. A counterpoint on that, and, and not to that you're in any way, shape, or form incorrect, and not that I don't share a lot of the concerns you have, but the key thing to keep in mind is that the way the council process is structured right now, the groups of stakeholders that get respected in that process are already defined, and they are the folks who are currently participating. It's the fishermen and the processors who are currently prosecuting the fishery. They are the stakeholders from the council's point of view. The next generation is not a stakeholder. They're not there during the debate about the allocation structure. And frankly, <coughs> the stakeholders who are there are all saying, don't discount me because you've got some other guy in mind who isn't even here at the table yet. And so there's That's a tremendous conflict in this process over exactly that entry level issue. And I think, you know, the, the only successful course I see right now, because communities are not well recognized as stakeholders, is for communities to become stakeholders by doing the kind of things that the trust is doing and some others are doing, where communities are actually acquiring fishing rights, anchoring them in the community, beginning to try and promote some kind of long-term community interest in the uh, turnover and intergenerational access to the fishery, and then moving into the council process with status. They're there as quota holders who are participating, and they then finally get full-fledged stakeholder recognition in the process. But you get, it, we're not there to any stretch yet. We're, we're just beginning to move that direction. You know, I, I'd like I, to I go agree, back. I agree with you because even in the fisheries trust, you have a fleet that understands what's happening and knows that their crewmen are not gonna be able to get in easily. And in the same breath, 
That same fisherman is like, I want it all, I want it now, exactly. and I kind of care about the next guy coming up. And the way that we've dealt with that is to have meeting, you know, really lay it on the table and talk about it. And without getting them involved in the discussion at, in depth, and we're starting to see more of the small day boat fleet going up to the council meetings. And, um, you know, and I wasn't around when the, that happened mm -hmm. earlier, and I don't know how many of them participated, but it's, it is something that needs to be talked about. And there is an inherent tension, and I get it. You know, you've got to feed your own family right now. Right. And those are realities that everybody's facing, and, and yet, you know, there's also the future. Mm -hmm. So it's a natural tension. Andrew, do you want to add something? Yeah, I want to add, add uh, just point out the proactive characteristic between the, the previous, the two, the two previous questioners. And I think, you know, Paul, I grew up on the Cape, and so I know the issues there, and I've been very impressed how proactive Paul was and the hook. And so going back to your question about are we going to get catch shares or not, whatever. I think if you think about it, and drawing a thread through all these comments, if you think about the issues that you see in your fishery, whatever they are, aside from what the council's thinking or the state is thinking, if communities say, look, we know what's going on in our fisheries. We see the problems, we discuss them amongst ourselves. Now there are these sort of alternative forms of, of uh, governance, these community structures that you can start building in advance of anything else happening and saying, uh, you know what, we've figured out a creative solution to these problems. And then when some regulatory issue arises at the council or at the state, You've got a structure, you've got a solution, you've got something that already works for you. The Halibut Sablefish Program worked and, and took seven years to get to the North Pacific Council, but it was designed basically by participants. It, it worked for them. They knew what the problems were. They were trying to come up with a solution. They didn't necessarily think they were going to end up with catch shares, but they essentially, as individuals, not necessarily as communities, they were proactive and said, well, we need to deal with these issues, and so this is the way we're going to do it. But my point is, I think if you uh, just think of yourselves as a, as a potential collective of collaborating minds, and you can say, look, these are the problems. We know they're coming down the pike, whether the councils or the state recognizes it or not. We want to get out in front of it. Paul got out in front of it, um, and he's been, the, the trust has been very successful because Paul could see with his Paul guys Parker. what was coming. Exactly. Paul Parker mm -hmm. at the Cape Cod Fisheries Trust. And so they just, he, they got out way out in front of it um, before anybody said, you know, here's what it's going to be. <coughs> and they were the first ones to get a sector and the sector allocation. And guess what? Now they have sectors in New England. They were leading the way. Charlie and then Jerome. Okay. Um, I just want to thank you all for coming. But based on what Paul Thiel just asked you, I have a question for Christine Barsky. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> 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 um, a a state-run fishery here, the lobster fishery, and you're involved in the fishery management plan. And I just was meant to call you this week, but since we're all here talking about this <laughs> now, um, I would like to know if you are hearing any noise about or receiving pressure from anybody to um, have any sort of a catch shares program put into the lobster FNP. Well, we're not that far along, but we're not getting particularly a lot of pressure. Um, what what our goal is, is to make sure that everything is considered. That's what you're... We've been asked to put together a framework. The idea is you don't make it so specific that you're locked into it, but it's broad enough and it has enough things, enough options in it that you can evolve if you need to. But nobody's pushing, I mean, the FMP is going to have to look at catch shares, it's going to have to look at co-management, it's going to have to look at area management, it's going to have to look at track limits, any, any and everything is on the board. <coughs> but nobody is, I mean, we, we know everybody out there, different people have different eye, ideas, but nobody has come down and said, you will do this or you will consider that. So that's what I can say so far. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, my question was uh, on the definition of sustainability. You have your, your social, or first comes ecological, that, that's part of the main part of sustainability. Next comes the social, which deals with what Elizabeth's saying, allowing young people to come into the fishery. And then finally the economics. None of it works unless you can make money. So my feeling was, do, do you two have a definition for sustainability? But it is a hard thing to define for most people. 
Definitely. I, um, the Cape Cod Fisheries Trust has its standards and metrics with its program, um, and I've seen them give a whole presentation just on that. Um, and they're coming to the San Diego meeting uh, this week to, to do that in part. Um, and so I, I can answer that question better in about two weeks uh, mm -hmm. when we'll presumably, you know, post the result that this network is working on. And it, it, uh, it, it's, a, it's a tough uh, thing to, to work on because uh, when, when, especially when you talk about the economic part of it, um, people want to talk about um, pricing issues, but, but not everything is in everyone's control, right? There are, so the group has decided they're going to try to work on things that they could actually have a hand in the outcome in terms of sustainability at the dock or the boat level, right? So when we talk about stock assessment and the way the Marine Stewardship Council defines uh, ecological sustainability, you know, that's not really in their hands. They, they can do things on bycatch management. Alaska Sustainable Fisheries Trust has a very successful rockfish bycatch reduction program in their fleet in the halibut sector, in the sablefish sector. Um, and they have their definitions of those, those triple bottom line elements. Um, it's not a perfect um, uh, set of metrics by any means, but in fact, we um, did sort of a global look where we hired a, uh, a good consulting firm that we trusted in Oakland, actually, to look around the world. Uh, the Responsible Fisheries Alliance, which is based in France, that looks at community fisheries in Southeast Asia and Africa. What were they doing for standards? Um, there's a Swedish set of standards, so we kind of looked around to see what else was going on out there. And there wasn't much where everyone really dealt with, the, with all three factors at the same level of intensity. So we'll see. Um, and that's why we're going to post it, so you guys could have at it, look at it. The idea is that you'll have a, um, you have three things, right? Social, economic, and ecological. And you'll have three basic standards under each of those things. And then you'll have a set of flex flexible metrics that different communities and different fisheries would actually decide they're going to manage and measure at the boat or the dock level that contribute to meeting those standards. So basically, you'll have a simple nine-point set of standards for the triple bottom line, and you'll have a very flexible set of metrics because you've got different fleets, different fisheries all around the country. But basically, we'll be able to say, this is what a sustainable community-based fishery means. It'll have a set of principles that you can then translate into a brand story and a market story. Because as Joe said, and you just said, you know, this needs to translate to making revenue, making it work. Otherwise, you don't have viability. We have time for one more question. Hi, I just want to ask if you guys have ever, uh, in your experience, uh, had discussions about inheritability to the children of uh, fishermen. Because if we talk about community, community sustainability, and if, if you witness in California, uh, often a lot of them now that they haven't made landing, their children can't fish, but a man may have spent his entire year mm -hmm. uh, working mm -hmm. on and building. And uh, I don't know if you haven't heard anything about that. I, mean, I can't wait. I miss it. No, that's okay. I, I don't remember us talking about it. I'd like to respond to that first and certainly invite you guys to. I, right now, that's one of the toughest issues that I'm working on, the issues of generational transition. Uh, the tension is, on one hand, in many, many fishing families, there's very strong interest in seeing whatever it is, the, the fishing assets of the fishing business, pass on to the next generation. And the expectation is that the quota that gets allocated to a fishing business should be something they can move on just the same way they move a boat or gear or any other asset that's employed in the fishing business. The flip side of it is we're seeing in many circumstances the second generation is not interested in getting on the deck. They're not interested in, in actually being directly engaged in the business. What they'd like to do is hold the asset, capture the revenue stream, but they'd like somebody else to get out there and do the work. And so the question is, what, what's the right answer under those circumstances? Does inheritance trump active engagement? Do you say, look, we're just going to reward you know, inheritance with quota the same way we allow other assets to pass? Or do you get into this issue of, 
not wanting to have a share crop kind of character to the fishery over time, stipulating some kind of requirement, you have boots on the deck to hold quota, which may mean when you get into the generational transition, there aren't going to be any kids you're going to get any quota because they're not going to have the active participation time that it takes to qualify. <coughs> We've got. I'm just am right now dealing with an estate distribution of halibut IFQ, and there's one kid in the family who'd like to fish, but he hasn't got his 150 days of sea time yet, so he's not eligible. Two or three of the others aren't. The bottom line is, after a lot of soul searching about it, they decide to liquidate because they're not going to qualify under the active participation requirements of that program. On the other hand, I've got folks in Crab who are actively trying to recruit their kids into the fishery, precisely because their hope is they'll be in a position where they'll not only be interested in the revenue side of it, but they'll actually be directly engaged in the business. I think that's a tough call. Thank you very much. This, these uh, discussions can be continued at in the summer. Um, it's just right next door for the people who are from out of town. Um, I very much encourage you all to come. Thank you for coming. Very much.